You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. And I have a returning guest, very cool guy, Sandeep Jain. He's a sleep specialist, a doctor, and uh, he's created a, um, an app that we spoke about last time called Listen MD. And um, what I'm going to be talking about, why I want to have him back is uh, Sandeep, I feel like, has a really a big heart for patients. He really wants to make sure that patients are listened to, doctors communicate about what's going on with the patient, and you know, patients aren't just like, you know, given a device and sent home and say, hey, good luck to you. Or, it, you know, the care is not just uh, emergency or sick care. That's my feeling. So that's why I wanted to have Sandeep back. So Sandeep, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Richard. I'm happy to be back. Yeah. So, you know, uh, this time you wanted to talk about um, the communication that does or doesn't go on in healthcare and how that affects patients' outcomes, you know, usually for the for the bad. So give me a sketch on what you see is happening specifically in the arena of sleep that is really not serving patients the right way. Sure. Uh, Sleep is a very easy problem to fix uh, in general, Uh, but just talking about how we are not doing things right can give a window uh, into why communication is the problem. Uh, Many uh, people are realizing that since the advent of medical records, uh, the lack of communication among them is causing harm to patients. Uh, doctors are busy writing notes and charts and not really um, looking at patients. A lot of patients tell me, oh, the doctor never looked at me and he was playing with his computer or his uh, transcription device. And uh, believe it or not, all that transcription doesn't get the patient anywhere. I mean, you are not helping the patient. You need to look them in the eye, tell them what's the problem, listen to them. So if patient comes to me with a sleep problem, they talk about how their CPAP machine is not fitting right, the mask is leaking, the mouth is dry. These type of complaints are there. The answer lies in the interface and information as to how much pressure the patient is on, uh, how much leakage there is from the mask, how long he uses the machine. And all this data is actually being collected by the machine nowadays in um, uh, chip, uh, which actually can be sent by Wi-Fi to the home health company that sometimes sends a fax to the patient, um, uh, to the doctor. But a lot of doctors don't know how to read it or evaluate it. And uh, there is a lack of time as far as how to go about it. Ideally, if a patient comes to my office, I would take their chip put it in my computer, evaluate the whole um, sequence of uh, events over the last three months and see where I can make changes to optimize their care. Uh, But uh, what kind of um, what what kind of information is available on these chips? Like what's an example of some stuff that's overlooked or not interpreted? Well, the machines are getting smarter. Uh, In the past, we fixed a pressure and it gives positive uh, airway pressure to prevent the closure of the airway. And if we set it at 10 centimeters, that's what it gave. Now many of these machines are auto titrating. They measure if the airway is closing and give more pressure. So if you had a beer and went to sleep today, you would get 14 centimeter pressure. And if you were a light sleep tomorrow, you would get six centimeter pressure on average. Then at different times of the night, you would get different pressures. There's a feedback that the chip is getting the data as far as uh, how many apnea events are happening, 
how many times they wake up at night, how many times they um, have uh, any problems like leakage from the mask. And that uh, it doesn't have to come in a chip. Some of these machines have a Wi-Fi in them, which gives the information directly to the home health company who can then produce a report. So, but, but then we are connect, collecting so much data, how to organize and store the data is the question. So now here comes how I'm using my program, ListenMD. So my patients now who have uh, the app that I've developed, they take screenshots from of their own phones. What is in their phone? They have the app that the sleep company gave them, which tells them what their usage is, how much leak they have had in terms of bar graphs. And rather than me chasing after this, the patient becomes responsible and in charge of the care. And they proudly take those photographs and then they are able to upload those into their app and save their medical record data. And then they can share it with the selected doctor's offices who want that information. So by putting the patient in the center of this data collection, you're getting more uh, accurate data. You are getting patient involvement in the data. It is much better. The patients themselves ask questions like, oh, when I look at it in the middle of the night, uh, my, it says that I have a apnea, hypopnea index. That is an index of how many times they have their uh, choking spells, uh, or, right. which is very uh, low. And then in the morning, the second part of the sleep, they find that their apnea, apnea, or apnea index is high. And, and well, I say, oh, that's because in the second part of the sleep, you're having more REM sleep, which is dream sleep. And so your apnea is worse during REM sleep. So they get, they yeah, get insight, that, that, you know. That's what I was going to ask you. Um, so the different, right, the different stages of sleep, do the muscles of the throat and the soft tissues uh, change their tone? You know, like in deep sleep, do they relax more and then the airway tends to close more? Is there a correlation there? Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, uh, the basic physiology of sleep for someone who might be listening and not know about sleep, uh, basically as we get older, our pharynge pharyngeal uh, or oral uh, cavity uh, soft tissue becomes softer, the tone becomes less. And as we become more overweight, there is more stuff in our uh, throats and that tends to fall back on itself when we sleep. And that's the snoring sound people make. And of course, uh, if you are so severe that you completely choke off, at that time, there is no air going through the throat. And at that time, the body is making efforts to breathe. And it is as if somebody is choking you from outside. And the, right. what does the brain do? The brain says, oh, my God, we are being killed. And the brain has to come out of its deep sleep to a lighter sleep to increase the tone in the throat and fend off this secret, uh, you know, person who's mm. closing up of their throat. And all that does not allow that person to get the deep sleep that they were supposed to get. So they never go into the restful stage three sleep or the REM sleep, which is the rapid eye movement dream sleep. So in the morning they say, oh, I'm still tired. Uh, and then they are having accidents when they drive the car um, and yeah. they are having um uh, 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 you know, feeling tired all day, having headaches, having high blood pressure, uh, having uh, adverse events, a lot of things, you know, uh, happen. I mean, you, you, if you if, if you are having a situation where your body is not getting oxygen uh, because you're choking off at night, uh, the results are uh, more, uh, you know, protein secreted in the urine, your sugar is worse, your pressure is worse. So, so it, it, uh, it can make a lot of things worse. And uh, I find that treating the sleep apnea uh, produces uh, a virtuous cycle where things get better, they get more active, they try to lose weight. Um, so, they, they, so it's a, it's a, it's actually getting very common as we become more obese as uh, American population, uh, and uh, the awareness about it is there. But to me, the sad part is a lot of people have CPAP machines that are living in their cabinets. They have never been optimized. They have never been uh, shown how to use them properly, never had the correct um, setting or mask adjusted. And that has to do with how we deliver medicine as a system. Uh, our system is yeah, what, uh, not what, optimized. What happens, 
what happens when someone gets a CPAP? Like how many times, who, first of all, who can adjust it? And how many times does the average person get it adjusted before they just give up? And how many times does the average person need it adjusted? Well, what's happening nowadays is the doctor has to get a sleep study and prove that a person has sleep apnea. That allows the insurance company to authorize a DME company, a durable medical equipment company, to provide that machine for which that company charges a monthly fee. And it's supposed to uh, give teaching, education, uh, and all those benefits. But many times the company does not have someone who is an expert and they would might they sometimes just drop off the mask and the patient is left to himself not knowing how to optimize the usage, whether the mask is fitting right. Uh, or, you know, there are different settings, humidity, ramp, dif different things that are not set properly sometimes. And once a person initially has a poor experience, they are turned off from that device. So you, it's not uncommon for me to see people in hospital who are dying of their uh, congestive failure or severe disease with pulmonary hypertension, but refuse to wear the machine because they have had such a bad experience with it. Uh, so so initially, um, setting it up correctly is important. Um, I have another question. As, as someone sleeps throughout the night, do they change the, do they, does the CPAP allow them to change positions? Or do you, if you have a CPAP, you have to sleep like on your back and not go anywhere? No, there's different types of masks out there that allow uh, more comfort. Um, in general, uh, sleeping on your back, supine position is the worst because, of course, the airway closes more. So there are a lot of people. No, no, I mean, who, it, 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 but, if you have a if you have a CPAP already, yeah, yeah, you have one on you. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming to that. So, of course, uh, uh, even a person who's using CPAP benefits from being on his side, and they are coming out with masks that have uh, the uh, tubings that come from the back. Uh, rather than from the side so that it doesn't get entangled. Uh, there are masks that are just full face masks involving the nose and mouth. Sometimes they're just nasal masks, but then you might need a chin strap to keep your mouth closed. Or sometimes you have just the nasal pillows which just go in the nose. And uh, uh, all these uh, are uh, very customizable and you have to choose the right mask for the right face, the right personality, the right pressure. So a huge amount of pressure, the nasal pressure, nasal mask won't tolerate it. So it's a, it's an expertise, you know. The, at our sleep center, uh, we have uh, the sleep technologists who have this cabinet full of multiple masks, and they can magically pull out the right mask for the right person um, and have them choose among the three, four of the masks, and then then you get perfect results. But unfortunately, that's not what usually is done. I mean. Um, hmm. so, well, what's um uh, people that have CPAPs? I mean, I'm sure you talk to hundreds of them. Do they change position during the night, or do do you know, like, or they just lay in one position and that's it? No, no. Of course, they change their position at the in the night. But if there's something wrong with the setting, uh, they might get too dry in the throat and pull off the mask because of that. Uh, they might have too much leakage, and that can dry their throat sometimes. Um, um, a lot of the, the the mask is not uh, something that prevents a person from turning from one side to the other in okay. general. I mean, the tubing uh, moves over uh, when they change their position. Um, but there well, are. You know why? Something occurred to me is that let's say you're laying on your back, right? And mm -hmm. you're laying in the bed, you know, for a while. I would think you would sink in as you lay there. You know, as you lay on the pillow, your head compresses it. And that would change the angle that your your head and your neck are at, or the bed. You know, your mm -hmm. hip area is heaviest, and that would sink in as you sleep. So I would think like after I don't know a half hour, hour, two hours in a given position, your sleeping position would change because just literally the weight of your body, which would mm -hmm. affect the amount of pressure needed by the CPAP, because it would change the, oh, the yeah. structure uh, of your throat and everything. You know, uh, definitely in our different phases of sleep, the tone in the throat changes. And uh, uh, different positions have different uh, situations as far as how much apnea will occur. In general, I prescribe a wedge pillow. What that is, that a hospital bed type of thing where you would keep your head a little bit up. That is helpful for patients with sleep apnea. 
uh, you get more acid reflux if you are lying flat. So uh, sleeping with your head slightly up and instead of buying that expensive bed, you can just buy a simple wedge pillow that goes under the mattress on the uh, on the head side of the bed so that you're at 30 degree up and that way you have less apnea for one. There are many tricks of the trade. There are special mm. devices being built that you can strap on the back. You can wear a t-shirt with a tennis ball sewn in your back, right? So then you won't sleep on your back. But they have uh, come out with specific um, devices uh, that do that job. Uh, and some of those can help, if, especially if someone has what we call as uh, position-dependent apnea. Uh, and then there are other mm. devices, not just CPAPs. There are dental devices uh, uh, that work. There are newer um, there's some invention going on all the time, so it's uh, quite uh, yeah, yeah. a lot of fun to see the new uh, things people are doing to help uh, people. You know, there's a new uh, system where you can um, directly increase the tone of the throat muscles as you sleep, like a pacemaker for your base of the tongue, which sort of contracts your tongue with every breath so that your throat becomes... Uh, more open. Uh, but the thought of something invasive like that is, uh, I, I, I hardly ever uh, go for that. Uh, I mean, you can yeah. lose weight, do exercises, change position, do lots of things before you would consider that, you know. Okay. Um, so what ha what kind of adjustments do you find that you need to make with your CPAP patients? Like, you know, again, this probably doesn't happen to such a degree with other doctors. So what do you see are like the primary things that they need help on? Communication. You need basically uh, a way for the patient to message the doctor's office and get some change made uh, uh, quickly so that they don't lose trust over the whole system. So sometimes you need to increase the ramp so that the pressure doesn't increase too fast so that when they go to a deeper sleep, only then the full pressure comes up. Sometimes you have to increase or decrease the humidity. Sometimes you have to increase the pressures. And sometimes you have dual pressures. Um, there's different other tricks to make it comfortable, like C-Flex. Uh, so um, sometimes uh, one of the most uh, under-treated uh, aspect is the correct mask. So having a system to optimally choose the mask is the key. Um, it, it's, it's where the you know rubber hits the uh, road, you know, like where, where okay. the interface is. And if the mask is uncomfortable, uh, it, nothing works. So they're coming out with better masks, better silicone, softer masks. Um, but the uh, health system uh, is not designed. You know, they have uh, rules. Oh, you can't change your mask. Or you can't have more than one. Or you got it wrong. So so a lot of times people are stuck with their. Um, situation and uh, it, it takes a lot of effort to uh, try to get them with the right device and the right mask. Yeah, what are the statistics on people failing to adapt to a CPAP and are those statistics better in your office, for instance? Oh, I don't uh, have uh, Richard statistics off uh, the top of my head right now, but in general, okay. the way I think about it is that one third of the people who come across a CPAP machine will love it, one third will hate it, and one third will come to live with it. It's not natural to have something pushing air on your face, but once they realize that they're awake the next day, that they don't have headache, that uh, the benefits are so profound that they love to use it. And sometimes they love the sleep that it produces and they say, oh, this is the best sleep I ever had. So uh, it varies. Um, uh, I think it's hard for me to see what I'm doing different from other people, uh, but I know that I can do better too, because uh, I'm just still struggling with how to use the optimal amount of data that these machines produce to constantly change and adjust what the requirements are for them. And uh, you would think with artificial intelligence and uh, stuff, you would be able to do it. I mean, if the machine is so smart as to measure how many apneas and leaks it has, it could easily send a message, well, maybe a message to the doctor as to, hey, we suggest that pressure is too much, let's decrease it, or uh, it's not that hard. So maybe I'll include right, that in right. the Listen MD system, you know, <laughs> to have the, um, to, to, 
to have this type of communication from DME companies. Uh, so I, I think the close communication between the DME company, the primary doctor, the neurologist, the cardiologist, the pulmonologist is all necessary. So in the ListenMD app, for every given patient, you have every doctor listed right there. And you also see when each other doctor's appointment is. So if five doctors are seeing a patient, if each of them see when every other doctor is seeing this person and can additionally quickly message them without disturbing them with the special messaging that we have, it will be, uh, then you can see change. The cardiologist can say his, this is what's going on. And then the pulmonologist can help with something else. And, and that too, without disturbing the doctors too much. It's a challenge uh, how to uh, use the data that the health system is producing uh, to optimally care for patients. Uh, the, the most important thing will be the patients will have to get in the middle. They will have to put all their doctor's information in their app and then put the, put the data and things that they have done in other hospitals and then share that data with the doctors that are uh, using the, their app so that then they can force the doctors to come to the same page. So if a patient puts all his doctors in and says, doctors, you're never on the same page here, I'll help you do that. I will um, put information out there. I will put who the other doctors are, and now you will be finding it more easy to connect to each other. Now, unfortunately, the EMRs okay. haven't done it so far, uh, and um, patients will have to get involved. Well, let's talk briefly. You mentioned uh, CPAP for all. That's an initiative that you've started. Yes, yes. Tell me about that and what's involved there. Well, I just got the domain name so far. I have yet to uh, build the website, but I've talked to some of the people who are uh, uh, who would be involved in it. Uh, the idea is that uh, sleep apnea is so common, 5% uh, of the population might have it, and it is uh, not easy for lots of people to get a CPAP machine and mask because of insurance issues, uh, they don't have insurance or they lost insurance or, or multiple reasons. And on the other hand, there are patients and people who have a second machine with one machine laying, lying in their closet. Um, I had one such patient today, in fact, and, um, the, uh, and uh, someone uh, might die and the machine was owned by them and then the wife says what do I do with the machine so then you would have a system where the people who have the uh, extra machine that they don't need would donate it to a collection center which would be basically one of the DME companies who would participate and then that company would for free uh, clean up and um, refurbish the machine and set it up and then a pulmonologist uh, who is a sleep specialist um, uh, or any other sleep specialist, a neurologist sleep specialist also. I mean, uh, a sleep specialist could then be in charge of telling one patient, you donate the machine and telling another patient, hey, you can pick up a machine from there and I will ask them to set it up at this pressure for you. And the communication that is going to entail, I'm going to use ListenMD for that. Well, um, so what's the total cost if it's uh, out of pocket? For someone to go to a sleep specialist, do a sleep um, sleep study, and then pay for a CPAP machine, like what's the uh, I don't know ballpark? Well, it varies, the, the but but the all. idea with the CPAP for all will be to make it free. Uh, you know, people would donate uh, the uh, sleep company or the machine making company would donate, and the uh, uh, DME company would donate. So that's a, that would be a non profit thing, uh, but in general. Uh, people can get a sleep study nowadays for as little as $150, I would think. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I really can't quote you the amounts. Uh, different people would charge different amounts. Uh, many years ago, there was a huge cost about it. But now, uh, you know, for $300, you can get a good um, uh, sleep study. And uh, for a few hundred dollars, similar amounts, you can get a CPAP machine. Um, and usually, many times, you don't even need the... Um, sleep study, but it's required uh, the way we do medicine. I mean, if someone has heart failure or some such condition or stroke where you have central apneas, you need a sleep study. Uh, of, uh, I would feel fairly comfortable if I saw someone who has severe obstructive apnea and I, if I had to spend $300 on a diagnostic study or a treatment machine, I would 
pay money for the treatment you know so so i would just uh, buy the machine and use a, a guesswork pressure uh, but that's not what a standard procedure would be if you have insurance you you prove the disease and then you uh, find the correct um, uh, treatment uh, is how we do it uh, but but right. if someone doesn't have insurance, we should be able to just give out the machine without even doing the sleep study. Um, well, that's why I wanted to ask you, because if someone doesn't have insurance or inadequate insurance or insurance says, oh, you're fine, but we're not paying for it, how much of a hill do they have to climb? Do they have to, is the sum total of the CPAP and the sleep study and the doctor's visit, you know, thousands of dollars? And that's no, why no, I think, I think everything should be insurance. possible. We should be able to do it for five hundred dollars. I would think I, I I might be wrong, but uh, but uh, it should not be that much. Okay, gotcha. Well, very good. Um, so we're we're just about out of time. Um, what advice do you have for people listening that are experiencing frustration? You know, because you can't. I mean, if you listen MD and through CPAP for all, you can help a lot more people than than are just local to you and that are your patients. But what's um, you know, if we have people listening that have apnea or think they do. What should they do? If we have people that have a CPAP and it's just, it sucks and they can't get used to it, what should they do? Like, what are some yeah. general suggestions for them? Yes, Richard. My advice would be to not give up on the machine or the technology, uh, to uh, know that the masks and machines are smarter and better than ever. And if they find the right person to get some adjustments, they can benefit from the treatment. And of course, the underlying problem is weight. So losing weight is the main issue that I would emphasize. And another issue is the sleepiness in the daytime can cause serious accidents. And uh, that's one social uh, issue that is there that uh, some people say a good percentage of automobile accidents are possibly due to sleep apnea. So, uh, So those would be important points. Well, very good. Well, Sandeep, what's the best way for people to learn more about you and ListenMD and CPAP for all? Well, the ListenMD.com is the uh, website for the uh, software I made that can be loaded by doctors and patients and the doctor's office, and they can connect two patients on it and among themselves and be on the same page for each patient. Uh, but for CPAP for all, I have yet to make that website. And uh, that, uh, but I'm taken up by that uh, idea that I have to help uh, people. Um, it's a simple disease and a simple diagnosis. And maybe with the CPAP for all, I will put some educational material and um, make it a really uh, not-for-profit um, enterprise. Well, very good. Well, Sandeep, thank you for coming back again to the podcast, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Richard. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.